champ is here. We will definitely not shut up and dribble. The champ is here. I must be the greatest. The champ is here. I'm going to continue to stand with the people. The champ is here. I will I not, not, not lose. lose. All right, man. I got I took up the Yes, welcome, welcome, welcome. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with we. I definitely hope our intro music was playing this time. We're still working <laughs> through that. So if there wasn't, we were sitting in silence, man. We were hoping you get it's your thoughts bitter. all together, man. <laughs> all right. So, um, hey, man, my name is EJ, and I'm here with my man. MH. He is the DB of the show, and we are Black in Sports, giving a voice to the culture that won't shut up and drivel. Here, bringing the best professionals in the game and in the boardroom. Here, covering it all, laughing it all, while providing a platform to be heard. So you know what we do right about now, man. We got to bring him right in. All right, so he's a champion, an investor. Okay, he's a creator. And, you know, um, it's a lot in those three words. We're going to work to uncover some of those uh, three words that he kind of leads by. Um, A lot of you know him as an eight-year vet. Um, so y'all may know him as a bear, y'all may know as a giant, but I know him as a Pittsburgh Steeler, you know what I mean? So we'll definitely rock and rep with that, man. So we'll, it'll be good to talk about some of those times, uh, in the, in the still city days, but he wants you today and moving forward is to mind your mind. And we're going to get deeper into that, man. So without further ado, um, he's a founder and CEO of Alchemy. Please, please clap it up for Ryan Monday. Let's go, let's go, let's go, man. All right, man. So the little intro, man, is just to get us started, man. So how we start the show is we ask all of our guests to kind of give us a shoot your shot moment. And that's just where you can tell us um, anytime you went for it all, you shot your shot. It could have been early days, high school, you know, asking that first lady out for that dance at the prom, whatever it was, you could have won, you could have lost, but just shoot your shot moment. Go ahead. Man, there's a lot of them. (laughs) I feel like I'm always shooting my shot. Uh, it is. Um, I would say really the biggest shot I took was making alchemy a reality. Um, you know, literally making something out of nothing, uh, quote, and, and taking the idea out your brain and, make quote, making it real, raising money against that idea, hiring people against that idea, getting customers, clients, helping people uh, based off of something that was literally just a twinkle in my eye a few short years ago. That, that, that is the probably biggest shot that I was shot. But uh, I mean, I think what enabled me to take that big shot was really just, man, I've been, like I said, I've been shooting shots on a daily basis. I have a motto, man, if you ain't shooting, you can't score. So like you can't make plays if you ain't shooting the ball. So I'm trying to make plays. There it is. There it is. Facts, facts. Right. right. Where did your love for sports start? Um, I think it was really just like an a, nat- a natural alignment. Um, you know, I showed up as always like the biggest kid, the strongest kid, the one that always had like a a lot of natural ability. And you know, the way things work out is just kind of you find what's meant for you. And I started playing football at the age of seven back in nineteen ninety two. And very early on, figured out, like, hey, like, I'm good at this, but I need to be put in the right position. Because that first year, I played offensive guard. I was the biggest kid on the team, the strongest kid on on the team, and the fastest kid on the team. And I was playing guard. And we went winless, and it was a terrible experience. (laughs) Uh, So so right then and there. Who's the coach? Who who, need to be nameless? (laughs) I can't even remember his name. It was just like, you know, (laughs) some local community guys. But the following year, my dad's best friend, uh, became the head coach and I went back out because I had quit. I was like, man, I'm not trying to play if I'm not getting like the ball. Point, <laughs> yeah, I'm not doing that. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't fun. Right. Um, and I told my dad, I was like, look, the only way I'm going out there is if I could score touchdowns. I wanted to be like Barry Sanders, Walter Payton, Emmett Smith, give me the rock so I could score. Because I knew what I was, but I just knew I wasn't being put in position. So my dad's best friend was the, the coach the following year. So uh, that that position switch came a little bit easier, and uh, it worked out. Uh, PA, right? Pittsburgh, PA. Grew up. Yeah, born and raised. Yeah, man. So tell me about uh, it's a lot of athletes there. So being the biggest and the best of those athletes, how how did the competition shake out? Uh, I mean, the competition was top notch. Um, I always not jokingly say, I very seriously say like Western PA is probably one of the best, if not the best places for like 
football uh, top to bottom, right, from high school to professional. Not many areas and regions, you know, can have a top tier high school organization and also a world class professional organization. But you got two uh, in Allegheny County. Um, and, you know, guys that I went to high school with in, in around that area, like Darrell Rebus was a year after me uh, from Western PA. I mean, we just have a ton of like uh, great pedigree and lineage um, that, that shows up in Western PA. And, you know, as a, as a little boy in, in, that, in that area, you kind of get two things. You get a, a football and a, and a, and a terrible towel, um, <laughs> you know, to kind of get you out the womb. So, it's you know it's something in the water, um, but yeah, I was about it, to say that it's, it's, it's in the water, boy. <laughs> yeah, I mean we we put out some incredible players. I mean, really over the last century, um, dating back to like Johnny Unitas, Joe Namath, Lavar Arrington, again Revis. I mean, just a bunch of people just come out of Pittsburgh uh, and do great things on the football field. Now, some came from your high school. Now, right. like, I I need some fact checks on here because, you know, sometimes yeah. the, the, the Google machine don't always be Googling correctly. So, um, Gronk is from your high school or from your area? Which one is it? The Rob yeah, Gronkowski? Gronk, yeah, Gronk went to Woodland Hills High School, the same high school as me. Uh, okay. At one, po- at one period in time, we had the most – uh, active NFL athletes on well NFL athletes on active rosters at seven and that was more than any high school in the country. Wow. Okay. Wow. Jason, Jason, Taylor. Taylor. Two, Jason Taylor. Yeah, that was yeah. for two years in a row. Yeah. Jason Taylor, myself, Steve Breston, Lusaka Polite, Shante Spencer, Rob Murkowski, Miles Dante Sanders, Miles, Miles yeah. Sanders, Darren Walls. Uh, Shout out to Joy Jefferson. Taylor. <laughs> Joy, Joy <laughs> Taylor went to my high school. I know Good Joy job. since you know, like early teens. Uh, so not only were we dope at sports, we were dope at talking about sports too. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I love it. Tell me though. But uh, track as well. So you did both sports in high school. So tell me about your track days. The number one question we asked is what was the, what was the races you had? Yeah, track was a, a really important part of my upbringing and like athletic development. I started running track quote, a little bit later, uh, I started playing football at seven. I didn't start running track till I was like 11, okay. almost 12. Um, but it was really important for me because up until that point, like I was natural in a lot of ways, but I didn't have like technique. And so like running track really taught me how to run uh, and gave me like that extra boost that I needed to kind of stay ahead of like all my, stay ahead of everybody on like the athletic curve. Um, but I tell kids all the time, like, man, if you don't know how to run, then like it's gonna be up here. <laughs> it's gonna be a, an uphill battle. Um, and that's what track really taught me was like the mechanics, proper mechanics of running, um, and, and really helped out my game of football. But in track, I was, I was good. I wasn't like a great track athlete, but I was really good. Um, I would run the hundred, the two hundred, and the four hundred. And the two hundred was like my best event quote, uh, and then all the relays as well. There it is. Okay. And then you said, like, you know, that was just a breeding ground for athletes. And, like, I just remember, you know, kind of growing up in the Ohio area, um, in both of those sports, you know, we would attempt to compete. And, like, the pin relays is, like, one of the biggest, like, track events, you know, that's held around in our region. And then if you want to go football, it was the um, was the Big 33, right? And, uh, and you played in that, right? Yeah, we got our ass kicked in the Big 33, but... <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a good experience though for sure um yeah we lost we lost pretty handily that game who do you um, do you remember anybody that was on the other team yeah Ernest Wilwright had a field day on us uh he played <laughs> he played wide receiver at uh at, at Minnesota but he had a really good game I was mad that game because I didn't get to play offense and mm. I was playing safety so I was only and it was like in that game, you could only play man-to-man coverage. You can't play zone coverage. So like, I was getting pissed because Ernest was scoring all the touchdowns, but I wasn't. I'm not a cornerback, so I ain't getting out there and covering that. You know what I mean? So like, it was kind of <laughs> in between. Um, but I was like, man, put me on offense, and I could like at least counteract it because I was an all-state wide receiver in, in high school too. So right. I was really good um, at wide receiver. But yeah, we we got we got crushed that game. So into the kind of the recruiting part of it, Michigan, how did the recruiting process work? And then you, like you mentioned, you all state receiver as well. How did you kind of 
settle on the defensive back portion of it? Well, I didn't settle on it. That's what was told to me. <laughs> they was like, look, like, yeah, you may be this, this, and that, uh, or you may think you this, this, and that, that wide receiver, but your future is on defense. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, you know, I, I, I kind of figured that for sure, um, but offense was a lot of fun. Um, but, yeah, Michigan offered me, like, earlier on in my junior season, uh, and they were recruiting Steve Breston pretty hard and heavily because he was a year ahead of me, and he was also my high school quarterback. So, oh, um, yeah. So did he that, help that get was, you there? Um, I mean, I jokingly say, like, yeah, because he's the greatest player to ever to come out of our high school. So, like, that helped. But, like, he didn't really help because he never threw me the ball. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't have a lot of highlights with Steve because he would just drop back and treat every time that he dropped back like a punt return and run the ball for like 60 <laughs> yards. I only had 12 catches my junior year. Uh, uh, so there's, no. there's not there's not a lot of tape to kind of go off of as, with me as a wide receiver there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was it was definitely a special, special time. But I – and we had a great high school team. Um, but, yeah, the coaches came in, you know, just with my body type, athleticism, and uh, disposition to want to tackle tackle people. Not everybody has that. That's a really important part of playing defense. You got to want to do it. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, in, in, a, in a lot of ways, I wasn't asked if I what I wanted to play in high school or in college. I was told like this is your future. So all American, right? And this is this is different from today's day and age where uh, you tweet out what your uh, you know who offers you and. Uh, you know, you do all the theatrics, like the, my, my guy that did the LeBron commercial to, to commit to uh, SC. Uh, yeah. So I guess your commitment way, how, how did you commit? Did you commit at the Army All-American game or is it something that you kind of already knew going into the All-American game, what you was going to do? Nah, I had already committed before the All-American. I committed in like December it wasn't as big a deal as it is now um, with like the video production quality, you know, all we had is really like rivals and student sports. Right. It was like basic broke down websites from early 2000s. But um, yeah, it was, I didn't, I didn't take all five of my recruiting visits, which I thought was interesting when I look back on it, I only took four, but I was, I was kind of sold on Michigan from day one. I mean, I wanted to get out of Pittsburgh, uh, and I wanted to play at a big time program and institution, Charles Woodson. There was a lot of like legacy that kind of played into it. Um, and, and although I did play in the All American game, I did not announce at the All American game. So that was a, but that was still a cool experience. So, um, Michigan, are uh, you played? I'm pretty sure against. Um, the do you guys what what did you guys call Ohio State? Because I know Ohio doesn't call you know you guys by your proper name. They call you guys a team of North. So what did you guys call Ohio State um, in Michigan? I mean, we, just, we just called them Ohio State. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and I think that was a big part or a part of like you know just the perspective that they have towards the rivalry. Uh -huh. Like you know, Michigan is a very like. Um, I guess maybe elitist institution, you know, we have a very high opinion of ourselves. Um, and in Ohio state, you know, has always been had that thorn in their side, like maybe they feel some type of way they're not in Michigan. Right. And they got to come up with nicknames for us. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but we, we always call them Ohio state. I love it. And then, so you finish at Michigan, right? And like you hit the transfer portal a lot different than how these guys get to hit the transfer yeah. portal nowadays. But so, yeah. um, you know, you, you graduate, you finish, and you get an um, extra year of eligibility because of, you know, the rules and CAA rules at that time. And then you go to uh, West Virginia. So, how did you choose that school or what, to, you know, kind of take us through that kind of decision process? Yeah, it, it was quite the journey. As you mentioned, I started at Michigan uh, in 03. I played my freshman year. I started all 12 games, including the Rose Bowl my sophomore year. My junior year comes around, high expectations. I get hurt during training camp. Um, hopes, dreams, aspirations feel like they're gone. Um, and I try to come back 
and and it was like early non-conference games, but was essentially playing on one arm and just didn't feel comfortable or safe out there. So I sat out, uh, and there was some friction that came with that decision. Um, and it, it it ultimately, and I'll share this, like ended up with me running scout team wide receiver that whole year. Um, so I went from starting safety to scout team wide receiver, and I was kicking the shit out of the. I'm about to say he's cooking, <laughs> niggas. Uh, cooking I was, the I was I was cook I was cooking them fools every day. They won't admit it, but I was killing them. Quite, I told mm-hmm. y'all I was an all state wide receiver, and I knew how they was getting coached. So like I knew every, so I was doing everything that they were coached against. So like I was literally out there torching them, um, <laughs> but that's because I was mad. But I came back my senior year, you know things were okay, but it just wasn't the same. Um, and and the season ended uh, with you know a interesting and tough conversation that I had with Coach Carr uh, that prompted me to make take my future into my own hands and say like, look, I'm out of here. Um, and I did that in December of 2006, the hard and I guess blessing in that was that I started that process, but the NCAA had rescinded the rule, the graduate transfer rule that was in place back then in January, 2007. Mm -hmm. So I'd already told Michigan, like I'm out. And then the NCAA was like, well, you can't use that rule anymore. So the balance of that 07 uh, spring semester was just spent filing appeals, getting letters of recommendation, the whole nine to kind of get grandfathered into this rule that's no longer existent or at the time wasn't existent. Mm-hmm. Uh, long story short, uh, I got in there, um, but the key to the rule was that I had to transfer to a school that had a graduate program that wasn't offered at my previous institution. West Virginia had that, and you know I knew the coaches down there. My cousin that played was an active player there. And there was a spot for me. So everything worked out. Starting to line perfectly. up, right? Yeah, it was it was actually really, really perfect and, and divine in the way that it happened. Um, but yeah, that was one of the hardest times of my life because I was a 22-year-old not knowing what the hell was going to happen to me. Um, because to your point, like, there was no graduate transfer portal. Like, I couldn't go. There was no portal back then. So I was just like, <laughs> I took a, another. That's what I'm saying. I've just always been shooting shots. Um but none of that stuff was in, in existence back then. But thankfully, it worked out. Yeah, and, and you didn't lose the App State then. You was out when they when they lost the App State. <laughs> that's why. They, that's why they lost the App State. That's why they didn't they- have me. Yeah, that's exactly what happened there. Um, but the funny thing about that is, I was at West Virginia, and we had a killer team that season. So that 07 season, I was at West Virginia. We was we were really good. Pat White was a quarterback. Pat Steve Slayton running. Slayton. Yeah, we had a we had a, a squad. squad. We could run laps around anybody. We that was the most the best condition that I've ever been in, um, and we were in the same setup because the year before we at Michigan we had the one two game versus Ohio State. Winner was going to the national championship. Yeah. The following year, uh, it it was a uh, LSU and Arkansas played on Friday night. Arkansas beat LSU. That meant we at the time were number three. All we had to do was beat Pitt the following day. Yeah. We were the national championship. We lost to Pitt like thirteen and nine or something like that. It was unreal. Yeah. What What's kind of your thoughts? And I know West Virginia was in the Big East at the time, but now they're Big Twelve, and then there's ten thousand teams in the Big Ten. So, kind of, what's your <laughs> little what's What's your thought on Big Ten and and, and Big Twelve uh, moving forward in college? I mean, I like what the Big Ten is doing. They're the only national conference, coast to coast, in every major market. Um, New York, Chicago, L.A. No other conference can say that. And and the yeah. game now ain't, ain't it's not regional. It's a national game, and it's about TV contracts and getting money for your conference. And they got that, and they were the first to get it. And that they're the first mover advantage that they are establishing is very very real. They literally tore apart the Pac-12 conference by themselves. <laughs> um, for real. Single-handedly. Also, single-handedly, they tore apart the Pac-12. They got U- USC and UCLA, and then they got Oregon and um, who was the other school? Stanford. Is it Stanford? Mm-hmm. No, no, Stanford's, Stanford's still there. They, it was Oregon Stan- and somebody else. It, it was gonna, one of the top tier ones. I don't yeah, know. but Stanford's yeah. going to stay there to the end and become like Notre Dame and become independent <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. Like I, I mean, what else can that. you do? Like pay, part, pay against right? Oregon State? <laughs> For the championship, play against Washington State. 
<laughs> it's so bad now. Like Colorado's getting out, and they were the worst team in the league, right? Until like you know, yeah, we come in, we come, yeah, in. exactly. <laughs> um, so you know, it's just an interesting time for collegiate sports. Um, I'm not as keen on like Big Twelve moves as I am on Big Ten. You know, just I spent four years at Michigan. It's a lot different type of like connection and relationship. I live in Chicago. Um, so like my perspective or just like day to day touch points um are a little bit different. I feel it. So now did you play in the uh I can't even say it, the backyard brawl? Was that uh did they take off at that time when you were at West Virginia or did they play that still? Because I know it took a brief no, nah, that's the game we lost to Pitt. We lost to Pitt at home. That one was the oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. The day after Thanksgiving, so, yeah, I think it was the day after Thanksgiving. We lost to Pitt thirteen to nine. Okay, so with that comparison, you know, so you just said you're a Big Ten. Which rivalry do you think was bigger? Like, I know it was bigger because of what was at stake in the in the game that you played, but overall, with kind of the history of of, of both kind of um, rivals, what's your and playing in both of them? What's your perspective on that? Um, with just between those two rivals, between those two, right? Like, which one, like, have because you know, from Michigan, since you're on the Michigan side, it may not meant it was just another game for you, right? Um, but just as far as like playing in those, it was, it was still a big rivalry, it, it was still okay. a big rivalry. We just didn't have like a special nickname for them, like the team down south, <laughs> yeah. you know, they got like a clock and all sorts of stuff, all of that stuff, yeah. yes, yes. Um, no, nah, by far, it was still Michigan, Ohio State. I mean, just. The um, the stakes on a annual basis for that game have been consistently high, so that the game always has like a lot of momentum heading into it. Um, and then just kind of like the historical context, like Woody Hayes and Ocean Beckler. I mean, there's a lot that kind of goes into it. Not saying that the Pitt West Virginia, or, or for that matter, any other like collegiate rivalry. Um, is like lesser but like the michigan and ohio state one you know there's just a, a lot of mustard that kind of comes with that um that's not duplicated in a lot of rivalries shoot even the rivalries that we have at michigan like michigan notre dame is a little bit different michigan michigan state it's that's different. different right mm -hmm. minnesota is our rival not many people know that we got a, uh, the little brown jug that we play for every year so <laughs> you know there's there's degrees of rivalry um but, you know, the Michigan and Ohio State one is it, really, really hard to beat just because of all the historical context and historical players. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I get it. So uh, kind of moving forward to the draft process, and I, and I don't want to do disservice to your draft process at all because I know there's a long, long, some long stories in it, and it's hard to probably put it into two minutes or whatever the, the conversation leads. So, but tell us a little bit about your draft process and how it went and then – you know, eventually finding yourself on a team that you grew up watching. Yeah, so we um, we lost to Pitt. We went to the Fiesta Bowl uh, and beat the shit out of Oklahoma. Beat the hell out of Oklahoma. I mean, yeah, we, they, they still have recovered, man. <laughs> man, they still have it, right? Um, <laughs> that that kind of set Sam Bradford up for, like, you know, his NFL, like, yeah. career. Um, yeah. But yeah, coming off shit. that game, like, and I had a great game, like, I was – yeah, I was ready for like what was next, and that included like getting ready for the NFL. Uh, the funny thing about that time, I did not play in any like All Star games. I did not go to the combine. I only had one shot, and that was my pro day. And so I knew that I could test well, big guy, strong guy, fast for my size. And so like I knew I I, I would perform well there, uh, and kind of was comfortable pushing all my chips into one basket and saying like, look, it's gonna be what it's gonna be. And so uh, I worked out in Naples, Florida with a, a few guys. Uh, Mike Hart was down there, one of my Michigan teammates, mm -hmm. another buddy, Michigan buddy of mine, Jamar Adams. We, were, we all signed with the same agent and was training in Florida. And, you know, I just continued to work my ass off and do what I've always been doing. Uh, and that set me up for a really great pro day uh, back in Morgantown. I tested off the charts, had re really great numbers across the board. Uh, and little did I know, like, the whole Steelers contingency came down literally to see me. So uh, Kevin Colbert, the general manager at the time, Mike Tomlin, uh, head coach, Dick LeBeau, defensive coordinator, Ray Horton, defensive back coach. They all came mm -hmm. down to Morgantown, West Virginia. I saw them there, but I didn't, I yeah. learned out after the fact that they were there to see me. Um, 
And so that was that was super dope. But I, I tested off the charts. Uh, I ran like a four five one. Uh, I benched two twenty five twenty three times. Like I tested, re- I tested really really well. Uh, so that kind of set things up, and then they actually flew me in for a visit uh, to to UPMP, UPMC Sports Complex, uh, and I went to a few visits, but this one in particular was interesting. And there's like a backstory to it because I didn't, I never took a wonder look test because I didn't go to the combine or any all star games. So the Steelers had me take a wonder look test. Um, <laughs> at the end of the day, like I did all these physicals, met the coaches, and they were like, "Here, man, take this test so we have this for you." The wonder look is like this, you know, uh, intelligence test where you have a certain amount of time to answer a certain amount of questions, like 50 questions. And they always told me during that test, like, yo, only answer the questions that you know the answer to. You all, you only get scored against the, the questions that you get answered, that you actually answer. So I was like, all right, cool. I'm going to only answer the ones that I know. <laughs> uh, and, and in 12 minutes, I answered 29 questions and I got all 29 right. And so essentially I got a perfect score um, and a guy came in. He's like, yo, are you some type of genius or something? I was like, why? He's like, cause you got them all right. I was like, Oh shit. Like, but at that, but at that point in time, like everything mattered to me, like whether it was a bench 40, like I just had to like excel uh, and find my edge. Um, but that ended up being the nickname that, that Mike Tomlin called me. Uh, my Mr. First Wonderland. Year two. Wonderland. Yeah. On the Steelers Wonderland. <laughs> That's awesome, man. And just playing with Tomlin, man, I had to be – I mean, of course I have admiration for him, man, being a Steelers fan or whatever, but just, you know, his <laughs> – what is your favorite? There's a uh, a meme or something that came out about his uh, isms. Um, I may be stealing some thunder from some quick hits, so um, I, I, I won't <laughs> I won't go into that too far. But uh, what was one of your favorite Tom, uh, Tomlin isms? I mean, I actually am kind of sad because it feels like he's developed – like 10 or 20 more since I've, I've last been there. He's had some time and experience to get some more, but the standard right. is the standard. It's always standard. It's a standard, today. right? <laughs> yeah. And then he would always say, uh, I don't know if he still says this. I've seen him with a t-shirt, two, two dogs, one bone. Um, like, look, we got, a, we got a bunch of players out here, but the reality is we only got one bone. Y'all figure it out. <laughs> He's like, I ain't gonna make that decision. Y'all gonna make that decision by how you work, by how you show up, by how you practice, and by how you play. Uh, That's dope, man. And, and like I yeah. said, great. You know, kind of going back to recap, right? Like going through having these achievements in high school where you were playing in the Big Thirty Three and on All Star games and the Army All American to have this rougher road to not getting any kind of like you know invited to the combine or playing into all these games and you know to get picked by that hometown team, man. So just congratulations on that perseverance. And like you said, just continue to shoot your shot, man, to make things happen. So, so you spent some time, you know, with some other teams, like I said in the intro, you know, you're always be a stealer to me, but um, you know, you spent some time with the giants and the bears, um, you know, probably had some of your statistical highlights with the bears. Which one do you kind of like spend the most time with? I mean, you're living in Chicago. I don't know if that's out of, you know, just your time you spent with the team, um, so, so tell us about kind of like what it was kind of like, you know, your eight year career spending with a couple of different teams. It was amazing. Uh, I was very blessed and fortunate to play for all the organizations that I played for because they all taught me something uh, different in your own, in their own unique ways. But starting in Pittsburgh, I played five years there and my rookie year we won the Super Bowl. So it don't get no much better than that. Like <laughs> walk right off the bus. I get back hey. to my hometown team. We are Super Bowl champions a few months later. Uh, backstory behind that, though, is I got hurt during training camp uh, and was knocked out. And, that, and they actually had to cut me for the first 10 weeks of the season um, because I was on um, – I was injured and there was no room for damaged goods at the time. Uh, but they did keep their word and said, like, look, as soon as we can bring you back, we are going to bring you back, but you just got to sit it out for 10 weeks. And so – uh, they kept the word, brought me back, and a few weeks later, a few months later, we was in the Super Bowl. Super Bowl. Uh, so that was, yeah, that was super dope. But I always talk about my time with the Steelers as being probably the most important and most uh, impactful uh, just because of, like, who my teammates were, who my coaches were, the experience that I had there. I mean, I listed Mike Tomlin, Hall of Fame coach, Dick LeBeau, Hall of Fame player. I was a primary backup for Troy Polamalu. Hall of Famer, Ryan Clark. 
I mean, we just had so many like legendary type of guys, and I'm just talking about on defense. Right. I ain't even talking about offense because we had a we had a lot of players over there too. Um, but it was just such a great organization to kind of get started to learn how to be a pro, uh, learn how to work. Uh, so to build that foundation, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that foundation was important. It was super important because when I went to my other teams, albeit like you know they 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 have a way of their own, but like when you when you know what it's like. At the top, and at the top. And, you, and you actually did it. You know, yeah. what I mean, you had a firsthand experience of like winning it and right. being number one across every statistical category. Don't matter what it is, run, pass, total defense, points, doesn't matter, turnover, sacks, everything. Like you know how things are supposed to work and how things are supposed to feel. That's um, cool. Yeah, so it was it was super dope. Um, I had a good time with the Giants. I had a really good year there. Uh, another injury kind of set set things back that altered some playing time and decisions there. But coming to Chicago uh, was really – I looked at it as an opportunity as like, look, man, like I'm almost 30. I know how to play the game. I've always been starter capable. Like this is probably my last hurrah to kind of have like that moment in the sun as like a starting NFL safety. Um, and so that 2014 season – I bought my ass off. We had, I had a hundred plus tackles, four picks, just like played really well as an individual, but as a team, we were terrible. <laughs> and that made it really difficult to kind of, you know, uh, not even accept it, but just like, it was, it was really, really bad. And not only tough from um, a team perspective, but just like a personal morale perspective, yeah. it was hard. Um, and then the following year in 2015, I got hurt. Again, I keep talking about I'm getting hurt, but I'm not injury prone. I promise you I'm not. I'm just like, when I get hurt, there's always like a key decision or a defining moment. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I had, I had back surgery in 2015 and, and never came back. So I had my best statistical season in 2014. And then 2015 was on IR with the back surgery. And then I retired in 2016. Wow. Speaking of moments... Uh, I think it was Brian McFadden has a he has a pod with uh, Patrick Peterson. He's he's talking yep. about Blu Ray on the plane, the Super Bowl year, and all that kind of stuff. So where <laughs> where was your city? Where, where were you sitting? Where was your viewpoint on, on on those games? Uh, I mean that's what I'm saying. Like we had guys like B Mac. We just had everybody. Uh, B Mac. It, it was a wild time. It was a great time though. I was I was always watching man. Like them dudes like. One, you know, them Southern dudes, they was always yelling at each other. And I'm like, man, I can hardly understand what y'all saying right now. So I'm going to just watch the game and kind of learn and just, like, you know, act like I'm having a good time. But they would boo anywhere and everywhere. Like, we would get off of the practice field. Or before we go to practice field, they would be booing. They would pause the game, go practice, and then come back and play more boo rain. No shower, no nothing. Just, like, look, we're going to finish game. Uh, it it was yeah we booed all, yeah it was uh we had a lot of gambling games uh in Pittsburgh a lot of gambling games and then I, I gotta ask this is the greatest Super Bowl in the world just the feelings of of that Super Bowl win against the Cardinals and um you know just how great the finish of the game was and what the legacy points for Big Ben and Antonio Holmes and uh, James Harrison. <laughs> Harrison, boy. He's still All that stuff. Yeah. Like, just how was that like playing in that game and, and, and winning a championship there? Debo. I mean, the, <laughs> the game The game was amazing. Um, it was – and Arizona was a really good team that year. Like, yeah. they had – Your boy, Preston, right? Was that, he on, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 1,000 yeah, yards. They had, that, that's the year they had three 1,000 yards. 1,000 yards, yeah, yeah. Three of them, right? And so <laughs> – that's unheard of in itself. Right. Their defense was pretty solid too. Um, so we knew it was going to be a really, really good matchup. Um, but yeah, so many things happened during that game and they happened the right way. Like, I don't know if y'all know, but like James Harrison was supposed to blitz on the play that he got. Mm, the he yeah. Like he was supposed to blitz. So <laughs> I don't know what, I don't know what got into his mind at, on the three yard line. that said, instead of blitzing, I'm going to drop I'll back. Drop back. <laughs> normally, normally, linebackers in particular who are told to blitz say okay thank you i've been waiting on right. that all game but he decides <laughs> to drop back and gets an interception and returns it 90 plus yards for a touchdown i don't know how that happens but it does 
Um, and there's a lot of things that happened right during that play that yeah. even enabled him to get to the end zone. Like Larry Fitzgerald got sidetracked by a few of his teammates that were too close to the sideline. So if a few of those dudes was back further, like Larry would have probably caught him five yards earlier. Um, but there was a lot of legendary plays in that game. I'll tell you a play that doesn't get talked about that much in that game, but it was very, very impress- impressive. Dominique Rogers Camardi was covering Nate Washington on a post route, and it he was beat severely. Uh, and Nate is very fast. Um, but it was probably one of the most athletic plays that I've seen DRC make ever watching football, where he did the speed turn, I believe, and just went from not zero to 100. He went to like zero to 200. <laughs> in a matter of in a matter of milliseconds, and ended up breaking the ball. I said, I have never seen anybody move that agile, that fluid, or that fast ever in a football game. Um, mm-hmm. But there was a lot of a lot of great athletes and a lot of great plays. DRC, Whew. he had a lot yeah, of. He was, he was, I mean, man, I mean, he, he had cold, like, bro. Yeah, like yeah, twenty was like blocks and field goal blocks in college or something crazy like that. Like yeah. I don't even know how you do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. incredibly athletic. Yeah, incredibly yeah. athletic. So um, kind of getting, because we're about to spin into, you know, um, your platform and, uh, you know, what you definitely ex- celebrated and kind of t- talked about this, what your shoot your shot moment was. But um, you started getting into education, became really big, like the later part of your, you know, career. I mean, even started in college, right, where you started your master's degree and then, you know, through, I believe it's the NFLPA or some of the things that they have going on, you know, you've gone and, and, and got some decorations as far as, when did the education portion become so big for you or when did that kind of, you know, start ratcheting up for you? I think it was something that got sewn into my consciousness like day one when I came into the NFL. Oh, okay. you know, Mike, Tom- Mike Tomlin has a lot of sayings, but one really resonated with me when he said football is, is, um, is not who you are, it's what you do. What you do, um, yeah. I was like, you know, coach, I hear you when I'm out here trying to get it. But it it kept getting reinforced by because we had great leaders. And I was always fascinated with, like, the union and union leadership and, like, representing players, player well-being, player welfare. And so, like, I had guys like Charlie Batch, Max Starks, Frank Clark was a, a union rep. So I was seeing these guys, like, operate on the business side of football and – a lot of the business side of football is talking about like benefits, like how can you take advantage of what the NFL offers you, whether that's through health and wellness, education, whatever it is, milk the cow while you can milk it. Um, And so I I would look into all these things and they were, you know, primarily revolved around like getting your school paid for or taking care of yourself or learning about something. Um, And I was like, all right, cool. Like I'm going to just start taking advantage of these programs because I knew, like, I was making good money in the NFL, but two things, I, low chances that I was going to make enough money to never do nothing ever again. And I just didn't have that desire. And so um, I started, like, educating myself because I knew or I believed that that would be the way for me to kind of avoid being another statistic on 30 for 30 broke. Um, it started out with some edu- executive educational programs at Wharton, Notre Dame, and then that culminated with me getting uh, MBA at the University of Miami, Florida in 2016. So I did all that stuff. While I was an active athlete, too. Which is dope, man. That's <laughs> so awesome. And the, and, the, and the names of the schools you dropped are some very – I mean, and people don't know, and some people have to remind me that Michigan is a prestigious as far as education. You know, their business school is one of the top B schools out there, too, right? So Wharton and yeah. the names that you – and Notre Dame, and so – and kudos to you, man. That's all big stuff, man. No, I appreciate it. And, and you know, kudos to, like, some of the programs that are available, too. Like, there's a lot of this stuff is reimbursed. So, like, I just had to pay up front for it, and then they gave me my money back. <laughs> so, like, I didn't see too much of a downside. And, like, look, awesome. let me go spend a few weeks here or let me, you know, pay for some more education because they're going to give me my money back. So, like, there's really no loss there. Yeah, man, we got to, you know, use those things that are out there for us. Hey, MH, man, you ready with them quick hits? Yeah, all right. So there's just kind of some quick get-to-know-you questions, kind of off-the-cuff type things. So top three teammates that you would shout out? Uh, Steve Breston. 
um, Troy Palamalu, and I'll say Lamar Woodley. Nice. Michigan grad, too. Uh, most memorable game? Um, Woodland Hills High School versus Mount Lebanon High School. Last high school championship game ever in Three River Stadium. Um, fourth down and like eight. Steve scrambling, but for whatever reason, he don't want to run the ball this time. <laughs> <laughs> and so he chucks the ball downfield to me. Of That's all times kind of that he could have taken off and ran, like, and I've seen him take <laughs> off some crazy ass times, like, bro, like, you really could have seen the ball there. Um, he checks the ball like 40 yards down the field, and I make like this Hail Mary type of catch that gets us down to like the two yard line. We end up scoring, but we don't convert on the X on the PAT and we lose the game. But <laughs> that game was important because it was like my real first time making like a real big time play in a big time right. moment. Yes. Um, and and I remember that. So first time if ever you've been starstruck. Uh when I saw Jay Z. Yeah, I saw Jay Z. Um he had came to it was in Pittsburgh, he was at this nightclub. I forget what tour he was on, but I was like, yo, that's Jay Z. <laughs> <laughs> he's my favorite artist so that was kind of a big deal Dope. Yo, your boys now how would they describe what you do for work now oh i don't, i only have daughters well I'm, I'm just talking about your friends just just oh. just if it was like, oh how would my how would my friends describe what i do at alchemy yeah yep oh um <laughs> they would probably just call me the mental health guy. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's a good transition right there. Yes, yeah. sir. So let's jump into it. So this is part we call the winner's circle, man. And, you know, we talked pre-show about this. I mean, want to get your flaws, but want to get into it, you know, with the time that we have left. And just really start off with, like, you know, I, I saw one of the tagline is, like, care for the culture, right? Mm-hmm. And I just hit home really, really hard. And, like, you know, the first time you told me about the company, the first thing that comes to my head is Alchemy, the book, right? So as we were doing the pre-show, that shows that, that there is some connection with that. And, you know, I'd like to for you to tell us so, you know, so you can share with our audience. But how did start with, like, how did you um, come up with the need for this kind of app and, um, you know, this kind of the whole Alchemy Health? How did it start, and, and what's the what's the synergy with the name? Yeah, so it really started um, kind of with two parts of my life that came together in one. So, like, transitioning out of the NFL um, and back in 2016, I thought I was ready because I did all this schooling, but I wasn't ready because <laughs> um, there's, like, an emotional and just, like, psychological and, identity component that I wasn't do, doing as much preparation on or none, no preparation on really. Um, Cause I just thought I was like, nah, I'm cool. But uh, it's a big, big transition because I started playing football when I was seven. Um, and so even though I had like these degrees and stuff, was still dealing with anxiety, depression, just general identity issues when I retired and knew I needed help outside of myself but didn't know how to access that or what to do or where to start or what to look for and with my own personal experience um you know i was like man like look you know i got resources and finances and i really can't feel like i can buy my way to like some support or help and my experience during that time like i found a lot of like self-guided tools that kind of helped me learn and grow and develop that's why Alchemy today is very much so like self-guided, self-driven, self-directed. Um, but all that it was that experience that paired with me because I couldn't find anything that I was looking for either from a therapist pr perspective or just like a general mobile application perspective that was focused on like folks who look like me um, in our community. And it also to my family was going through a long list of chronic health conditions. 
type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, heart attack, stroke. I've seen all these things happen in, in a period of two and a half, three years. So that was the personal side of things. The professional side of things, when I retired from the NFL, I was I was getting after it and on the business side of things, just like networking, getting into the venture capital space, made a few investments, et cetera. And I was like, yo, like there's nobody really kind of stepping up to the plate to create like a game changing company that's focused on the black community and venture capital VCs, entrepreneurs about solving big problems, but I didn't see nobody solving that problem. And so I just kind of took my know-how and unique experience sitting on the investor side of the table with my personal experience that I was going through and saw firsthand and just put a, put a deck together and started raising money against it. And, and uh, one thing kind of led to the next, but it's, I tell people I haven't done anything more difficult than what I'm doing right now. Um, and, And that's a very big statement based off of some of the things that I've been through, overcame and accomplished throughout my football career. This is equally as challenging, but in a lot of different ways. Funny you say that. How much of, it's funny, the the timing that we're taping this is during NFL preseason. And there's a lot of young rookies or uh, maybe even veterans that are on the bubble, I guess you would say, and kind of looking over their shoulder and every mistake is probably highlighted right now because they're fighting for jobs and stay power in the NFL. So how much of that mental part that you grew, that you did and experienced in the NFL, how's that serve in your, in, in your work today, mentally wise? I think it, it's helpful um, for sure. And, and helpful in the ways of like, look, I know how to work. I know how to be uncomfortable in work um and and overcome and persevere and all those things but sometimes there's 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 i think a tipping point now uh where that can be too much of a superpower uh where like i can the i can do everything attitude like um i don't ask for help attitude like all these things that kind of show up that can if not uh properly manage can turn into things that can actually hurt you instead of actually helping you. Uh, and this is like, this is not just isolated for me. This is just like typical entrepreneur founder type stuff, right? Like you got to really figure that out. And the hard thing about my transition was that like, I just literally went from tackling people to being CEO. I ain't never had a real job. I ain't never really like built a company job. Like all these things were relatively new for me, not relative, they were new for me. And so here I am having to figure out a bunch of things every day, all day, constantly. Um, and and the thing is, like, yes, I have the willingness and disposition to go out there and try things and run into brick walls, but also, too, like, there needs to be support systems, things that you can kind of play within, i.e. having coaches, i.e. having a playbook, like all these things that I had that helped me be successful. Uh, were no longer a part of my day to day. I didn't have many coaches. I didn't have a. I was when you're an entrepreneur in a startup, you are making the playbook as you're going, and so like you don't have, you don't know what you don't know. So you have to kind of put things out there and kind of like piece them together over a period of time. And I just didn't have the experience uh, in business in 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 that environment to piece things together. So this was really kind of my first lap that I'm kind of completing right now. Um, but yeah, it, that, and that's why I say it's been like a life-changing experience because the degree of difficulty is is what it is, but the I think the lack of experience and the lack of know-how made things really, really hard and probably more hard than they should have been. Who did you lean on to, to do some of these things, right? Because like you said, especially as an athlete, right, coming where you, we, we are successful, uh, the, whether we want to believe it or, or, or own up to it, having a coach, right, like having that structure – you know, where, you know, like, okay, shit, I got to be to practice or, you know, I got to train this to get there. Right. When you're an entrepreneur, you don't, no one's telling you to do that stuff. Like you have to build that, that muscle <laughs> and that discipline to do that. So who did you lean on to do some of those things, man? Like where, where did you reach back to or, or, or how did you push through to get those things? Man, I just, honestly, I dug deep on, into myself. Um, and that's why I say like, it can be a good trait, but it got to the point where in retrospect, it was probably too much self-reliance. 
uh, and not asking for help enough or bringing other people in. Um, and I, again, all lessons learned uh, as it's water under the bridge right now, but um, really just kind of taking a step back because the thing is, you can't necessarily win the game, quote, until you like learn the rules of the game and kind of understand like how your skills show up within the framework of the game. Absolutely. And that's what I tell young athletes now. It's like, look, you didn't get this far by like changing the game. You got this far by understanding one, the rules of the game, two, like what positions are available, and then three, like what positions you can play best, right? And then going out there, working your craft so on and so forth and finding some of the, like the agency and the creativity within the constructs of constraints. People always act like constraints are bad. No constraints are very good because they give you guardrails and framework on how to like perform. And, and, and that's, and I was kind of anti that. I was like, man, I'm just going to go out here and do everything different. So on and so forth. I didn't know that, no, oh, but you, you need some constraints. Like you need some framework. You need some of these things to kind of put into place. But I, I, I didn't make the connection that, like, man, like, I always had those things in football. Like, you know, cover two is cover two. Troy could play cover two a certain way. He did play <laughs> cover two a certain way. I played cover two a certain way. But at the end of the day, you're playing cover two, right? And you have a responsibility there. So, like, as much as I – because I, I had a hard time, like, equating things in football because I didn't want to. But the reality is I had to go back into that bag and say, like, what – Help me make sense of this based off of like what i built my life on 100 percent. and then like getting into you know who is alchemy for like tell us like what's that sales pitch why should why should you know me mh or any of our listeners what what's what's there for us that we need to tap into what's that alchemy is culture for mindfulness and mental well-being a lot of times everybody says go see a therapist and that's like a binary experience like you're either doing it or you're not doing it. And so like, well, what is the in-between uh, or what are the steps to either, uh, again, be in-between before or even after the therapy office? There's not many, if any, particularly for folks who look like us. And so uh, we come to the table with like mindfulness practices that show up in a, like an audio format, very much so like calm, but with black voices, black sounds, black perspectives, et cetera. And then also, too, we break down complex topics uh, in, um, that relate to mental health, right? And so whether that be being Black in the workplace, generational trauma, we take licensed experts and we have them talk about uh, these topics and also provide skills, tools, and tactics on, like, how to navigate uh, through the lens of, like, mental well-being. So, like, again, those are, like, two things that I didn't really see out there, like, Talk to me about some of these fancy words that y'all are talking about here. Like, what is trauma? Like, what are all these things? Like, <laughs> there's there's a lot of things that you know we kind of take for granted, but we 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 simplify it and make it available uh, for for everyone, but designed through the lens of like black wellness, black culture. One thing that's on the site and I thought was like powerful is uh, most of our lives are filled with trying to fit into. Uh, an environment rather than an, an environment fitting with us. Is that kind of some of the premise uh, of the company is just making the environment fit us as a people, as a culture? Yeah, I think in, in making the environment fit you, it's not about changing the environment. Sometimes, sometimes it's about changing you. Uh, um, yeah. and, and a lot of times, well, at times we need to know which is which. Sometimes we have the agency to change our environment. And if we do, we, we should exercise that. And if we don't, then we have to accept it. And then we have to figure out like, what needs to change about me? Um, and a lot of times on the ladder, we don't like having that conversation. Um, but I tell people in the same vein of like difficult and hard, like 45 pounds is gonna be 45 pounds. Now, if you're not able to lift it at first and then you're able to lift it, you know, a month later, what change? Not the weight, you change. You right. got stronger. You got better. You use def you use different techniques. Ain't nothing about the weight change. You change. And so, like, if we have, if we really always think about how to start with self, um, and and take space in the in the environments that we occupy, uh, sometimes it's not the space that needs to change. Sometimes it's us and how we show up in these spaces, and we talk about both. Love it.
So question for you, as far as access to health, right? Like, you know, we definitely see a disparaging like gap between the access to health for our culture, right? Besides the, and this could be two different things. I just want to get your perspective on it. So besides the um, cultural aspect of like going to a therapist, like we're starting to get past that, right? So Charlemagne and the guy talk about it. We've actually talked about it on our podcast. We always do, we do a health check. You know, you're seeing people, you know, talk more and more about it. But what are some of the barriers um, to access for mental health? And is that, you know, really what you're looking to do is uh, provide that gap or provide like that pathway for us? Yeah. So as I mentioned, like, you know, going to see a therapist is super binary, either doing it or you're not doing it. Uh, And a lot of things get in the way of uh, folks from actually doing it, starting with uh, the knowledge gap. You don't know what you're looking for. You don't know where to look for it. If you do know the answer to those two questions, then the next one is like, did you find what you're looking for from a culture for perspective? Um, there's just not enough um, black and brown providers in this space to meet the growing demand. And so the, the there's a huge imbalance just off of folks who are who could potentially be looking for black and brown so, uh, therapists and experts and their uh, success rate in actually doing that. And then you throw in like costs, can you actually afford it? You may or may not have insurance. Does your insurance cover the person that you want to work with? Does your does the person that you want to work with even take insurance? A lot of people are moving to cash pay only, time constraints, uh, geographic constraints, all these things get in the way um, and prevent people and become access barriers from getting the help that they need. But that's why we started with content saying that like, look, you download our app, uh, you uh, you subscribe for ten dollars a month, sixty dollars a year. You could have unlimited access to leading experts talking about generational trauma, being black in the workplace. We got over four hundred plus pieces of content on our platform, all designed for us. So. What's 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 changing in your industry now? I know when you play, I think we're all around the same age. When you started playing, I'm sure there was two backs, twenty one personnel, tight ends everywhere hard play action pass. Now it's bubble screen spread out. So in the mental health space, how do you see the industry changing and what's, what's kind of evolving even since you've been in the space? I mean, I see the industry changing and I'm relative. I acknowledge that I'm relatively new to this category, sub three years close to it, specifically mental health. Well, I've been an athlete and taking care of myself my whole life right so I think there's a lot that kind of comes with that and that'll get to my point I think a lot of folks are coming to the table now with life experiences um, that you know bring credibility uh, and a different perspective than one that may differ from traditional medical perspective uh, that feels somewhat antiquated lack of innovation or just like so much rigor behind the academics that they can't move they're not moving agile or freely or thinking freely. So folks like myself are coming into the space with a a different perspective and not burdened by some of the traditional paradigm handcuffs that folks who come up in academia may have. And I, I've by and large been received well in the space because I don't have a medical degree. I don't have those credentials, but again, I got a lot of life experience. Uh, and also professional experience. And so there's a lot to be said to that. So I think that's where like the kind of industry is moving and becoming more accepted of folks, whether they be influencers, entrepreneurs, et cetera, coming into the space and supporting and helping people. Because as I mentioned, just the, the actual number of like, quote, certified folks in the space is going down. Mm. And so there's there's help that's needed and we we can't be so rigid uh, on how or where that help comes come from. We, we need to keep an open mind about what help means and where that can come from. So um, one of the things the app offers as well is meditation. Was that a practice for you during your playing or is that something that you're getting more into now or that you've been into? Um, it's something that I've had to battle with. Uh, so, you know, doing guided meditation and you know, seeing how, you know, you can introduce that in your life. Where is that for you? And is that just one of the big kind of um, practices that just really help with the mental health? Um, I would say that I was just, I knew I needed some quiet time when I was playing. 
and I knew I needed some space. Um, I may not even know that it was actual meditation at the point at, at that point in time, but I was just always really big into like, look, I don't always need to be on 20. I just need some time to just like be still, uh, recharge or, or get focused. So that's always kind of been in my DNA and, you know, kind of just looking back over the course of my life, things have always just kind of shown up uh, in a way that have kind of been like, I guess, little breadcrumbs that have gotten me here. Um, just around like perspective, my experiences, my life experiences, family experiences, all these things have kind of culminated to get me here. But my specific practices, I, I think really started to show up when uh, when I transitioned out and I was, I was literally just kind of going to YouTube and just Googling like motivation videos and self-help videos and just like, look, man, somebody speak some positive language to me or something. Um, and that, that, I think not more than anything, but was was equally important and like really shaping how Alchemy showed up. Um, a, a, a theme that we kind of have on this show is about information. There's a lot of information out there <laughs> nowadays and just information in general, you have a lot of access to a lot of information. Do you think that's, um, do you think there's any issues with that information now on how to channel what's right and what's correct and how does that plays into uh, just your overall mental wellness on the day to day. Um, I, I think we we should have access to anything and everything that we want to have access to. I, but with that, and now I'm just always a proponent of like, look, well, okay, if it's out there. What, how are you going to respond to it? And so, like, start with self. And so, we need to, you know, have the the self governing tools that not always click on everything or read everything or <laughs> build up our level of discernment to know that no, nah, that's just a bunch of baloney um, or not always feel the need or the tick to, you know, have the TV on. I find ways to understimulate myself. So like if you come to my house, there's very rarely a TV on. Um, I don't really ride in a car and listen to anything. Uh, I'm just always trying to find ways to like understimulate because to your point, there's, unlimited amounts of access and information and things out there. So I, I don't, and if you're taking it in all the time, then you won't get tired. And when you get tired, my coach used to tell me your technique breaks down, <laughs> things will fall through the cracks and you will get scored on. <laughs> and so in the effort to not get tired on too much information, I don't take in a lot of information. Um, and so that's that when the things that I do need to take in, I'm clear, I'm conscious and I'm present and I'm not to um, affected by things that are on my mind or could be on my mind that don't really matter or make a difference. That seems like a point for me. No, don't try to explain. No, 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 no. I'm not trying to do anything. Okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You know how much I love DB play. So I got to play. I think it's the hardest position on the field outside of quarterback and and maybe center, right? But, you know, for a DB, you have to understand where your help is. And then – people try to throw a lot of things at you with motions and, you know, try to throw a lot of just kind of dummy things, motions and shifts. And this route, this person going to fly out here because I'm trying to get this person behind here. I'm sure that helps in today's life as well. Right. You can, you can, Hey, that's just a dummy motion. All that's junk. Just eye candy. No, no. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because again, I think that to, to know that that's a dummy or like window dressing, like you got to have an elevated level of like awareness. Fair. I don't, I'm not sure if we have collectively as a, a society have elevated levels of awareness to understand, you know, <laughs> what, what smoke and mirrors, you know. That, that's, that's, that's a good yeah. point. That's a yeah. good point. I'll take it. I'll take, I'll that take point. another point. I got, yep. I got, I got a rebuttal. I'm gonna let, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll take that point. That's a good. That's a good point. That's fair. Yeah, that's man. It, I can acknowledge it, it, that. You know, my coach used to tell me common sense ain't always common. Hey, facts. <laughs> Super fucking facts on that, Ryan. Super facts. All right, so since, so, so since MH is bringing up past stuff, I want to get your point on this, right? I think this is going to bring it home full circle for us. Um, do you believe in CTE? And do you feel that some of this health stuff is – because we have someone we have someone on, on our show that doesn't fully believe in the CTE. Nah, I'll let you answer, Ryan, but there's there's reasons for why I say that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I 1,000% believe in, in CTE. 
Um, you know, it's well documented um, at this point. The studies, the hard, well, the unfortunate part about it is that like no one knows until you pass away. Um, and, and so that's been really, really tough. Um, but yeah, I, um, I believe in CTE. Yeah, I think Channing talked, Channing on uh, the pivot kind of alluded to a little bit what I was saying was, I don't, I, I don't think we um, factor in, as you mentioned, the transition of identity and uh, all those type of things that go into a, a player leaving the game and into a, a different, their next career, right? I think there's a lot of anxiety and, and depression that can yeah. come with just kind of identity things. And that's why I would say like, yeah, I mean, I just think it's easy blanket CTE on there. I think there's some other things that go into uh, behavior is all I was saying. Thanks, EJ, but I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I get that. But, you know, at the end of the day, like, it's just like a, what the causation it doesn't have to be the diagnosis, right? So, like, both of those could be true, right? So, just because right. something caused, you know, CTE to be activated, CTE could still be true, right? But, like, what right. is the trigger to kind of, like, turn it on? I don't know. Um, that hit you put on there is Haywood Bay or the Raiders? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's hard not to say that those – now, to what degree do they play? I don't know. Or, like, right. how it materialized. I think, you know, there's a lot of questions around that. And then you start to factor in lifestyle and, like, yeah. other, these other things. They they probably they probably definitely play a role. Um, but the cumulative effect of, like, playing football over a number of years, hits like that. Um, just, and then also, too, people don't talk about the wear and tear on your body. Um, like, the body, it that's a lot of the of just like work and strain on your body for an extended period of time. And that cumulative compounding effect, I, I don't think it's talked about as much either because it, you know, guys walking around hobble, bad backs, all that other type of stuff too, you know? How, how do you, how do you stay kind of, I mean, on the physical wellness, how do you keep yourself fit now? Cause I, I would imagine there's a, whole nother way you work out besides when you were playing working out. I think that's probably two different things. How do you, how did you learn that? Or is that something that you were already practicing in your career? Uh, that's definitely something I had to learn because prior to that, it was, you know, being in the gym for two, three hours, half a day, whatever it is, get it in. Um, <laughs> but now, you know, I don't really have quote time for that uh, or interest to be in the gym that long, but I need to find out like, you know, how am I taking care of myself and what does that look like as almost a 40 year old compared to 10 years later, top of my game. Um, and it, it's, it's been an adjustment for sure. Um, and there's been definitely some changes about my body um, that, you know, I'm not the same anymore. Uh, I lost damn near 20, almost 25 pounds. Um, I don't look the same anymore. There's a lot of things that have changed, but primarily just trying to make sure that I move and really just kind of doing the basics. A lot of times it ain't got to be that difficult. So I just try to drink water, breathe, get sleep. If I ain't doing those three right, then, man, that stuff's letting. So really just try to stay stay with the basics and then move my body. You know, man. All right, man. Jumping into um, this uh, section we call the assist, man. And this is where you drop drop some dimes, some knowledge on us. Um also, just like maybe words you live by, a quote or something you would tell your younger self. But just uh, what's um, give us a, a the assist or a coaching gym. Which one is that? Like something that I live by. Yeah, something you live by, or maybe a quote you live by, a mantra, um, or something you would have told your younger self. Um, I mean, a perspective that I have is it's always now. Um, and so, you know, the past has no reality. The future has no reality. Everything always happens now. And it really just kind of reinforces me being present and in the moment. Um, another one, make plays, just make plays. That's it. Um, and those who know what that means, know what that means and everything that kind of comes with that. Uh, what I would tell my younger self, <clears throat> huh. 
I would I wouldn't want to do anything different. So I would just tell myself to trust my gut. So that's what I did back in those circumstances. Yeah. Like, look, man, like you got it. Like, don't let nobody try to talk you out your game. Because that's what people will do. They'll try to talk you out your game, try to get you to believe something that they want you to believe or whatever the case may be. Like, don't let people talk you out your game because they'll try to do that every day of the week. Uh, so that's Absolutely. what I was talking about. I love it. All right, man, if you can, man, tell where we can find the app, you know, uh, give them your website. We're going to put all this in the show notes as well. But uh, go ahead and plug some of the stuff where people can kind of get in touch with you uh, just to learn more about the journey and kind of get connected and, you know, um, make sure they mind their mind. Yeah, for sure. So on a personal level, I'm Ryan G. Mundy on all uh, social media platforms. And on uh, Alchemy side of things, uh, we are Alchemy Health, A-L-K-E-M-E Health on all social media platforms. Our website is alchemyhealth.com. Again, A-L-K-E-M-E health.com. Check us out. We got 400 plus pieces of mental health uh, video courses, mindfulness practices. We host live workshops. We have wellness kits, email newsletters. We have a bunch of things available, uh, all that you can access anytime, anywhere. Uh, so come check us out and, and at least get started for free. We have a free account here where we make things available uh, for those who uh, may not be afford to access the unlimited package right now. So come one, come all. Uh, we're here for you and let's build together. Love that. MH, final thoughts? Not much after that, man, Ryan. Just appreciate your time, man, and, and spreading the knowledge. And uh, best of luck in future endeavors and all, all moving forward for you. I uh, appreciate y'all, man. This is dope. Absolutely, man. Well, please, please, um, as you know, want to thank Ryan for jumping on the show. Want to thank everybody that helped us get in touch with Ryan, man. This has been a you know a journey, and, and excited to have him on. Just not only from you know. Um, seeing someone from one of my favorite teams do big things uh the things that he's doing afterwards it's only going to help us um as a culture so please make sure you tap in um you know share the episode uh because you know um we're all dealing with something um and it doesn't it's, it's all on different shades or levels so you know um this is a resource that's available to us so you know take some time you know he, he said there's those free resources so check it out and um you know maybe not for you share it with a, a loved one um, because you could save someone's life. So uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you, Ryan, for being on here. Um, please subscribe to the YouTube channel because uh, visual representation matters. If you see it, you can be it. Um, please download or subscribe. We're everywhere. <laughs> you can listen to podcasts. And as we always say, please, please stay safe, practice gratitude, and know we're rooting for you. Screaming, all this black status, sports and entertainment until we even. Too many are rooting for everybody that's black. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Too many I'm rooting for everybody that's black. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Too many I'm rooting for everybody that's black. Smack bouts to racks on handmade new racks. Too many I'm rooting for everybody that's black. It's everybody from sports to college class to rap and back.